All right, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your trustworthy words. We ask that you'd speak to our hearts this morning. Please give us ears to hear your voice as the Bible is explained. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I love Romans 7, this passage that was just read. It is special to me personally. I was 22 years old working in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I was clueless about Christianity. I had made one foolish decision after another, and I thought, I need to change. And on some level, I wanted to stop doing the evil I was doing and to start doing what's right. It just so happens at that time, my mother, who'd been praying for me for a long time, had sent me some CDs, those old things on Romans. And I thought to myself, well, why not have a listen? And when I reached this part of Romans 7, I thought to myself, I have never heard anything so true about myself in my life. Paul's words in verse 18 were undeniably true. He says, for I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. You've probably experienced this to some degree at least. You want to change, you're not changing. As a 22-year-old, I saw I was actually unable to change. I'm sure you know something of that dynamic. Unable to change, at least not consistently. And Romans 7 explains why. It's because of sin. See, sin's grip on us is so tight that we cannot consistently obey God's law. And God taught me that as a no-nothing 22-year-old. But what I didn't realize back then as a fresh convert is that this is true for the Christian. See, after trusting Jesus for forgiveness, I thought rather naively, well, great, new life in Christ, which is true. But I thought naively, well, there's going to be no more struggle. Well, how wrong I was. See, sin is so powerful in the believer's body that we cannot consistently obey the Lord as we would like to. Now, I'm aware, as many of you are, that this uh, passage is, there's a huge debate in Christian scholarship about this passage. And the debate is, is Paul speaking about himself as a Christian or as an unbeliever? And there are thoughtful, well-respected Bible teachers on both sides. And we could actually spend this whole sermon detailing the arguments for each side. But I think it'd be more beneficial to all of us if I just teach the text. I've already kind of put my cards on the table. I think Paul is speaking as a Christian, and I'm going to teach it like that. Now, as I do, do that, let me just remind all of us that the authority in God's church, whether this church or any other, is scripture, not the preacher. And so please, by all means, measure what I'm saying against scripture as you do each week, no matter who's preaching. Now, with that in mind, let's just look at this. Paul is, what he's doing here is he's clarifying misunderstandings that his Jewish listeners may have about the law and the gospel. We saw that last week. He's just affirmed in verse 12, that the law, the law of Moses, it is good. Sin is the problem, not the law of Moses. In verse 13, he anticipates another objection. Does that which is good, the law, bring death to me? And he says again, no, no way, not at all. That's a bit like a criminal on death row blaming the good law that he's broken for the punishment he's about to face. Sin is the problem, not the law. Now, from verse 14 onward, Paul starts to focus on sin's power in himself. See, ever since Adam rebelled, we are sold under sin. That's humanity's condition. And that still impacts us as Christians. We'll see in a moment. So let's look at this under two headings, the Christian's conflict and the Christian's confidence. So first, the Christian's conflict, and I'll just warn you ahead of time, this will be the longer of the two points, okay? Verses 14 to 24, Paul describes this inner conflict that he experiences as a believer. And notice the conflict, it's between his inner desire to do good, to do the law, and the evil he actually does. 
This conflict runs all the way through Paul's description of his Christian experience. Paul is so agonized that by the end of this section, you can see in verse 24, he cries out, Ugh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And Paul confesses this as a believer. Now, why do I say that? Well, for one, think of the unbelievers that you know. Most unbelievers I meet seem to think I'm a pretty good person. A wretch? No, not me. But if we have any doubt that Paul is speaking as a Christian, the beginning of verse 22 should take that doubt away. Look what he says. I delight in the law of God in my inner being, inside. That's a believer. Only a believer would feel that way. I inwardly want to obey the Lord. Deep down, I want to please him. I experience the greatest joy when I'm obeying him. See, as Christians, we have a new attitude to Jesus, new love for God's law, new desires, new direction. Our attitude to sin is different than before we trusted Jesus. If you can think of the times when you were not yet a Christian, isn't that true? You're, you have a different direction in your life. But you can see what Paul's saying. There's a big problem my sinful body. Imagine for a moment being chained to a stubborn mule. You want to move forward, but the stubborn mule pulls you in the opposite direction, and it's incredibly frustrating. Well, that's a bit how Paul feels. It's as if his inner person is chained to a stubborn mule, except the mule is his own sinful body. He is so frustrated by his body of sin and death that he cries out, wretched man that I am. And notice he says that I am, not that I was. Now, maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, I don't know, Paul, uh, aren't you being a bit extreme? Are you really that bad? Well, let's join Paul as he shares his journey to self-discovery in verses 14 to 24. First, he observes his actions, how he actually lives. And then when he looks at his actions, his actions reveal that he is a walking contradiction. He is divided between what he wants to do, the good, and what he actually does in practice, the evil. So look, for example, at verse 15, he says, I do not do the good I want to, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, it's not that Paul never obeys the Lord. We read of Paul's missionary journeys. The whole direction of his life was shaped by the gospel. But there is a gap between how he wants to live and how he actually lives. He's never the person he really wants to be. Now, isn't that your experience as a Christian? You want to be a more patient spouse or parent. You want to be a more obedient child. You should. A kinder person. You want to be more self-controlled, and you tell yourself, I will never lose my temper again, or I will never, I don't ever want to look at that again. But then what do we actually do? Well, the very things we hate. I hope your stone faces are agreeing, and I'm not the only one who feels this way. We've all been there. We have. We've all been there. Now, why, though? Why do we act like that? Well, it's verse 17. It's because of sin that dwells within me, Paul says. The other day, I was walking down uh, Putnam Avenue, and an older couple was looking inside this window, and they saw a strange house decoration. It was really strange. It was a black snake on the floor. And the husband said to his wife, who would put that in his, their house? And he's right, of course. Who would? Why would anyone put a symbol of evil in their house? But as I was walking, I thought of it more, and I thought, you know, forget the house. That serpent nature, sin, dwells in me, which explains why I do the very things I hate sometimes as a Christian. And here's the thing. Even if you don't yet consider yourself a Christian, you say you're not a Christian. Haven't you experienced that you fail to live up to your own standards, let alone God's? Paul tells us why. It's sin. Now, if you're not yet convinced of Paul's answer, May I ask you, do you have a better explanation than Paul's for why universally we do things that on some level we don't even want to do? 
See, maybe Christianity is not so crazy. As a 22-year-old, the reason I couldn't dismiss Christianity is because it explains reality. It wasn't religious. I thought, I heard this and I thought, this is what I'm like. And for the first time, someone's telling me why. I understand why. As Christians, we know why we're walking contradiction. But do we realize how strong sin's grip is on us? Well, in verses 18 to 20, Paul reflects on what his actions reveal about his fallen human nature. Notice the temperature's turned up. It's not just that he says, I do not do the good I desire. He says, I cannot. I'm unable to. You see that in verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. We prayed that earlier. There's no health in me. For I have the desire to do what is right. But notice the language, not the ability to carry it out. I cannot do the good I want to do, he says, not left to myself. And you know, we hate hearing that. It cuts against the can-do American spirit. I can do whatever I want to do. I can do whatever I put my mind to. Um, No, not in this area. While we're in this body of death, we cannot measure up to Christ's standards. We never will. The truth is that there is no health in us as we confess each week. And again, we may not like to hear this about ourselves, but isn't it true? There are things about us that we wish we could just flip a switch and change. Bad habits, bad patterns we wish we could forever break from, be done with. We do, we want to be like Jesus, kinder, gentler, more patient, less selfish, less irritable, but we cannot reach the goal. We fall short every day. And we find that verse 19 is true of us. The evil I do not want to do is what I keep on doing. See, sin is so ingrained in us that Paul concludes that it is a law in verse 21. See that word? Now, in verse 21, Paul uses law the way we use law when we speak of the law of gravity. The law of gravity is, of course, not a set of commands to be followed, but it's a scientific principle, a rule that is always true. Well, Paul, who has a PhD in human nature, has discovered the law of sin. What is the universal principle? You see that in verse 21? When I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. It's just there. It's always there. And didn't you experience that this morning? Why is it such a battle just to get to church? Well, because of the law of sin, the principle of sin. It's as constant as the law of gravity. That's why. And that's why being a Christian often feels like a civil war is taking place inside of us. You're committed to the right side of the war. But the rebel power indwelling sin in our members, that just means body parts, is not giving up without a fight. Do you see that in verse 23? Christian life is warfare. What Christian has not experienced sin rising up daily to attempt to drag us back into captivity again? Or what Christian hasn't faced? You know, it's a sin. Maybe we thought, oh, I put that to death. No, it's back with more force than ever before, it seems. And here's the thing. Here's why this passage is so important. This, it's so realistic. And that's what we need. We could fall into despair if we don't have this realistic view that it's a daily battle. It is a lifelong battle. Our sin nature does not just vanish the moment we first trust Jesus to forgive us and rule us. We are inwardly new, but we remain in this sinful body of death until we die or until Jesus returns first. As Christians, look at ourselves. Does anyone here have a resurrection body right now? We are still made of flesh. We're weak, fleshy humans who still share Adam's fallen nature and will our whole earthly lives, okay? So let's think about what this means for us as Christians. If you come across books or blogs offering secrets to living the Christian life on a higher plane, promising a breakthrough, a total release from sin's power. Let me do you a favor, save your money. Stick with Romans 7, stick with Paul. See, this passage helps us because what would happen if we did not have Romans 7, if it wasn't in the Bible? Well, we could easily as Christians end up in despair. 
J.I. Packer, some of you know he wrote Knowing God and a bunch of other great Christian books. He's a wonderful Christian scholar, passed away several years ago. And he trusted Jesus Christ the first time while studying at Oxford. And some unsound teachers afterwards came in and told him, you know, you need a second experience after becoming a Christian. If you could just have this second blessing, the second experience, you will never struggle with sin again. You'll be released from its power. So he listened and, and tried to go along with it. And he was too honest with himself and he couldn't pretend. And he was still sinning in thought and word and deed every day. And no matter how many times he reconsecrated himself or rededicated himself, he still struggled with sin. And, you know, he said he could have become very easily suicidal. Until, in God's kindness, Packer read the writings of two pastors, John Owen and J.C. Ryle, on the Bible's realism about indwelling sin. They were explaining Romans chapter 7. See, isn't it encouraging to hear someone talk realistically about Christian experience, especially an older Christian. I can think of one friend, many of us know him well, who's a breath of fresh air because he talks like a Christian, not gloomy and down. He's quite joyful, actually, but there's no pretending. Yeah, I'm in a body of death, so I'm going to sin. Now, he's not complacent, but he's refreshingly realistic which is what we need. You know what can happen? So we look around and everyone looks so nice. You do. You know what can happen? We can start thinking, you know, everyone has it together. Maybe I'm the only one struggling with sin. No, you're in very good company. Dear Christian, you and I will never be as Christ-like as we long to be, not in this life. Perfect Christianity, a perfect Christian life is impossible. And the more we're confronted with God's good law, the more we read of Jesus's perfect life, the more we'll confess with Paul, wretched person that I am. I'm not even close to measuring up. I cannot wait to be delivered from this body of death. Christian perfectionism? Our response to that should be, if we know ourselves, kind of that laughing emoji with the tears streaming from its eyes because it's such a funny thought to think about. Now, please don't mishear what Paul's saying. He's not complacent about sin. He hates it. And that's why there's this conflict. If we're in Christ, we will resonate with Paul's cry, who will deliver me from this body of death? How I long for a sinless resurrection body. It's a cry of frustration. It's a cry of groaning. But it is not a cry of despair. Because notice, secondly, the Christian's confidence. And again, this point will be much shorter. Paul knows that he will be delivered from this body of sin and death, that he will certainly be resurrected from the dead, given a resurrection body like Jesus's body, a body that can never, ever sin again. Now, how is Paul so confident of this? If he looked at himself, he wouldn't be very confident. And that's precisely the point. Paul is confident not in himself, but in God who raises the dead. He says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we, of course, share Paul's confidence in Jesus. We know that none of our sins will be counted against us because Jesus, when he died on the cross, bore the full penalty that we deserve for all our sins. There is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. What that means for the future is that when Jesus returns, we can be sure that he will on that day deliver us from this body of sin and death. It's in the future, this, this deliverance, and it's certain. Now, perhaps you're sitting here and you don't yet share Paul's confidence. It is possible Someone here is realizing for the first time, you know, I'm a failure. I've failed my family. I've failed those I love most. I've hurt them. And most of all, I've failed God. And it's dawning on you that sin has a grip on you that you cannot escape. It's impossible. The message for you is the message that we all need to hear, that Jesus Christ is able and willing to forgive you the moment you put your confidence in him. 
for us who share Paul's confidence, know that a day is coming when we will be delivered from this body of sin and death. The battle will end. It will. But until that day, until we die or Jesus returns, verse 25 is our present experience, and it always will be. Conflict. Battle. Verse 25 is a, is a tremendous anti-climax, but it is real Christian life. It says, keep battling, keep going. Do not be discouraged that we fail to live the Christian life the way we want to live it. That will always be the case. Don't despair. Don't be surprised when you fail. It is humbling. It is agonizing to long to do good, but often do the very thing we hate. But you know what it teaches us? It teaches us to keep trusting Jesus, not ourselves, until the day we see him face to face. Let me close. John Newton, the cruel slave trader turned gracious pastor, he wrote the words as we often sing, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And if we know ourselves, we'll sing those words with greater conviction the longer we've been a Christian. Wretched person that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful that you do not treat us the way our sins deserve, but that Jesus took the penalty that our sins deserve when he died on the cross for us. And we rejoice that he is risen from the dead, and how we long for him to return. We long for the day when we will be set free from this body of death. Until that day, help us to keep trusting you, Lord, and battling against sin each day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.